All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning into the show uh, this lovely Thursday morning. Um, today I have with me Professor Ashley Hughes. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, now, you're a professor at Johnson & Wales, but um, I'd prefer you to say exactly what you do. Um, I would hate to get it wrong. So you, you <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> so, so it's probably a bit of a, a longer explanation than it needs to be. So yes, mm -hmm. my, my primary job is a professor at Johnson Wales University. I'm an associate professor here. I've been here for the past five years. I teach in the Center for Physician Assistance Studies. Um, I primarily teach courses in patient care, clinical medicine, ranging from anything from ears, eyes, nose, and throat, all the way through emergency medicine. On top of that, I also work clinically as an emergency medicine physician assistant. I work at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, and also Kent County Hospital in Warwick, Rhode Island. And I do a bunch of other things, including uh, research, global health work, um, and essentially anything that I think is very interesting or will help the um, global community. Right. Now, um Clinical research, that kind of being sort of a broad term, what, what exactly is that kind of honing in on? I know there's, I'm sure there's all different uh, branches you can go out on, but mm -hmm. clinical research meaning, um, you know, like, like uh, medicine or, or uh, you know, diseases and that type of thing. Yeah, so, so you're correct. So there's, there's a lot that's involved in clinical research. So clinical research can be anything from looking at new innovative technologies, so things like biomedical engineering and how that can affect patient care, um, to, you know, actually going out and seeing the effects of maybe some sort of education or something you do in the community and how that affects a certain population. Uh, what I typically do is, so my most recent project is involved um, in providing training to uh, bystanders. And in providing training to bystanders, the goal of my research is to see, are they able to retain the information that they're being taught? And can they teach this information to others so that the skill that they're being taught is then um, pushed forward to others so that it's getting out to as many people as possible. And that is really focused on medicine and healthcare. So that's where a lot of my clinical research is. Okay. So bystanders being um, just like people who aren't in the healthcare correct. Uh, industry? Yes. Yeah? Yep. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, now, I, I read a little bit of your bio and um, it seemed like you did some I mean, obviously, this is all very interesting, but it seemed like you did some stuff before uh, you became a professor that involved you kind of traveling and going to different places and kind of working with, um, you know, different kinds of people. Yes, I did. So that was actually um, while I was still acting as a professor. So I'll just take a bit of time off, go travel, get that work done because it's very meaningful for me. So it's important that I reserve that time to do those things. I think what you're referring to is the time that I spent in Punta Gorda, Belize, working with um, mm -hmm. their clinic that's out there. So I, I very specifically wanted to go to this area of the world because there's a clinic there that it operates seven days a week. It is not a pop-up tent. It's not something that appears when there's enough healthcare workers to, to man it. It's something that's there constantly with staff that's always there to help take care of people in the community. And they really rely on volunteers to go down there and to function as healthcare workers. So I went down there for a few weeks so that I could um, work in their clinic. It was, prim it was mostly primary care-based medicine, um, and it was treating the individuals who live within that area and also up to about a six-hour bus ride away from the clinic. It also involved going on a mobile uh, health unit and driving out to villages that were a few hours drive away to treat individuals that had no ability to travel to the clinic site. So we were really servicing a really broad um, or a very large population of people. Um, and this is something where I'm going to continue doing this every year. So it's important to me, it was important to me to find a place that allowed for me to do that. And specifically Healthside Health Clinic um, was very amenable to that thought that I had of, you know, being able to make this something consistent that I could do so that I would be very much embedded in the community. Right. How, now, how different is it? Because in my mind, going somewhere like Belize would be... Uh, Definitely a culture shock. How different is like the healthcare system there? Um, because again, I don't have, I'm not super well versed in this uh, subject, but it seems to me like having a mobile unit 
I, I personally have never heard of a clinic doing something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that seems like it's something different, something kind of specific to that region. Yeah, so it was very, very different. So I, I didn't have an opportunity to work in one of the bigger hospitals that was in the major cities. So Belize City has a hospital there that I'm sure is probably similar to what we have in the United States, except the resources might be more limited. Where I worked, it was incredibly limited. So our resources were, were pretty minimal. So we would have patients come in with anything from things like um, lacerations, uh, machete wounds, fractures that had not been reduced or splinted, um, chronic illnesses like hypertension, diabetes, with their associated complications. And then we'd have children coming in for well visits, and we'd have people coming in for um, pregnancy-related care as well. So in terms of the resources that we had, like I said, it was very limited. So we had to do a lot with um, you know, the scarcity of items that we did have. And a lot of what we did was prescribing medicines for those particular illnesses that the person had and use what we had available for you know, suturing, splinting, things like that. Um, I was very lucky because they do have a pharmacy team that comes down and they try to have a pharmacist there um, every time the clinic is open. So I was able to actually write prescriptions and have those prescriptions being filled in-house in that very tiny clinic by a pharmacist who was living there for two years. And this is a pharmacist from the United States who came down to live at this clinic for two years to support the pharmacy aspect of the clinic. So I would say that that was, that was great. That was very different from what we have here. I mean, well, of course, we do have some clinics that do things like that in the U.S., but um, as far as I know, going out to another country and having that ability, um, that's not incredibly common. So I was very happy that that was there. And as far as the mobile clinics go, that was kind of a, a shocker for me because I've never worked on a mobile clinic before. So what we would do is every day we would go down to the pharmacy and we would um, package supplies And then we would go to our supply closet, package supplies, and we'd go to a truck. And one of these trucks looked like, and I joke around with people and say that it looked like the trucks from Jurassic Park, basically. And we would pack it and we would have these huge boxes that three or four of us would have to lift and heave and throw over the top of the truck that had things like antiparasitics. So we were seeing, you know, tons of different types of infections, things that we don't typically see in the U.S., Um, And we would just gather everything we could, fill the truck with as much as possible so that we could set up some sort of outdoor treatment area in one of the villages that we were going to to work at for that day. So we drive about two or three hours, unload the entire truck, set up our station. We would treat all the patients. And to get the patients there, we would drive around and just honk the horn on the Jeep (laughs) so that they knew we were there. And once they knew, they, they would bring, you know, their, their loved ones over. So moms would bring their kids over, um, you know, adults would bring their elderly parents and we would spend hours there treating them, providing the care that they needed as best as we were able. And then we would have to pack everything back up, put it back on the truck and then drive a few hours back. Um, so it was a very long day and it was, um, pretty labor intensive as well. And there were many times we had to get creative. Uh, we had one individual who worked with us who, um, lived in the area. So he lived in Punta Gorda. Um, he was very, very talented when it came to, um, building things. I would often call him the, the MacGyver of the area. So when we had kids, um, who needed nebulizer treatments for really bad asthma, I can't even tell you what he did to be perfectly honest, but he would somehow (laughs) use power from the Jeep to then use the nebulizer that we could, we would have power so that we could use that machine because where we were going, we couldn't just plug things into an outlet. That just was not possible. And he would make it so that we were capable of providing nebulizer treatments for those children that needed them because you can't really get you know a six month old to take an inhaler the same way you or I would be able to take an inhaler if we were wheezing or having respiratory issues so I would say the the entire experience was so different from what I was used to in terms of caring for patients Um, but it was a very humbling very amazing experience something I'm grateful for that I I hope to go back to, again, like I said, every year, but I want to do this on a larger scale, and I'd like to bring my students with me as well. That way, they can get the same experience that I had, and then hopefully, they'll want to return back and give back to that community. And maybe one day when they're practicing as PAs, they'll bring their own students. So I'm hoping to be able to... um, 
to do that. That's my, my long-term goal. Right. Pay it forward. Yes. Um, it seems very much like a, a, a labor of love, everything that you were pretty much talking about. Um, is it common for other countries, um, some that may not have the resources like you were mentioning or the, uh, maybe the uh, innovation or the, the collectivity, um, is it common for them to bring in people from other countries like the U.S., like these other incredibly developed nations? So that does happen, but it happens in a different way. So there are NGOs. So these are organizations that are nonprofits that will um, have mission trips. And they will have providers. They, they will post it and say that they need providers for a trip to, say, Guatemala or a trip to Peru. And, you know, they'll recruit providers. They'll recruit other volunteers that are non-medical. And they'll have a trip to one of these countries. And that trip will be for, say, a week. So the entire team will go out for a week, care for patients. And they care for a large number of patients when they do that. Usually, you know, in the hundreds of patients per day as they're doing that. And then when the trip is over... That, that clinic that they um, set up is gone until the next time they come back and they set up a clinic. And that could be, um, you know, maybe a month or a couple months or, you know, it's down the road at some point. It's not an everyday thing. So I would say that's probably the most common way that people get involved with uh, global health care. Um, and it's a very good way to start. As far as the experience that I had, it was different because I had to uh, apply for a Belizean medical license and prescriptive license. So I had to go through the Ministry of Health and um, get approved to have licensure to practice in that country. So it was it was a different process. And I think it was different because the clinic that I went to was a clinic that was there all year long. It, it didn't come and go. So that I would say is less common than the the NGOs that have physicians, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and nurses go out and treat the population. Sure, I can imagine, um, you know, being pro- being a citizen of one of these places and seeing kind of this this uh, resurgence of of people of medical professionals uh, coming to really help. I can imagine it being making a real big difference for them. It does, and they show their appreciation the moment you get there. I, I remember one of my first days when I was on a mobile health clinic. Uh, I didn't know to bring a lunch or pack anything. I mean, I went down there with very little <laughs> supplies for myself, and mm-hmm. we had the people that we were taking care of. They had some of their family members come over and they had made us food. They, they had made some rice and some beans. They had a couple of other things that they, some fruits they had for us. And I, I was so moved by that because these are people that don't have very much and they were showing their gratitude for what we were doing for them and the other people in their village. And that, that meant a lot. That really did. And that showed to me that, you know, they, it's a two-way street. We, I appreciate being there to help them, and they appreciate me being there to help them. So it, it's, it's very, it was very nice. I didn't expect that, and it was just, it was so kind. And I think it, it just demonstrates exactly what you described. You know, their their appreciation for the the healthcare that they're being given. Sure. Also, must give a, a real sense of a of a global community where I've spoken about this before on the show where. There's so many people on this planet that it, we're kind of far removed from the idea of having a community, even as the human race. Mm-hmm. So it seems like when there's a situation like that where you're able to help people who are a little less fortunate than we are, then you can really kind of come together. And you can see, like, the, the, you're sitting down with these people who you've never met. You don't know, you know anybody else there, but they're really appreciating everything that you're doing for them. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And they're just so welcoming also. So there were times where we had, uh, there were a couple people that drove by the clinic every day. And when I say drove by, they were either um, on their bikes or they were walking by. And they just took a few moments to stop in and say hello. And that was, again, something so, so kind and nice. And it it made me feel that I was part of their community. It made me feel like I belonged. Um, Yes. And I loved that. Now, uh, I always think about nurses and teachers and people in these fields and in my mind it's like how a person that chooses to do those kinds of things has to it has to come from somewhere else it's not like oh i'm I'm just going to be a teacher 
I'm just going to be a nurse. Like it has to come from somewhere else. Like you have to have a, a deep feeling to, you know, want to help or, or want to learn and these type of things. Is that, is that kind of what brought you into this field? That is what brought me into teaching the PA program. Absolutely. So prior to teaching the program, I was a full-time clinical PA in emergency medicine. And as a clinical PA, I was doing a lot of bedside teaching for students that were on clinical rotations. And I really enjoyed the bedside teaching. And by that, what I mean is, you know, sitting with them and showing them procedures like this is how you do a lumbar puncture and then watching them do it and guiding them through so that they could become skilled at that procedure. I really enjoyed it. Um, and then I found that I was moving from there to then, you know, talking to the students and when they asked questions, providing these small mini lectures and educating them and supplementing what they were learning in school. Um, and that made me feel fulfilled. It was something that right. I think I needed that I wasn't quite sure that I needed at that time. So because of that, I did become involved with PA education on a very small scale. So I just kind of um, dipped my toes in it a little bit. Um, taught one course, and then I realized, you know what? I like it. Every time I leave here, I feel good. I really genuinely feel good. And I then picked up another course. And then before I knew it, I was a half-time employee teaching. And I was really looking forward to every time I came in and went into the classroom and discussed a topic and broke it down to what I felt were simple terms that they could understand and really remember so that they could have great patient care. So then I became full-time. And after I became full-time, I then, um, you know, became the academic coordinator in my drive for doing that was because I wanted to um, create this education that the plan of the education made sense. So in PA education, it's a two-year program. And in the first year, we call it didactic education. And in the second year is clinical education. So I wanted that didactic year to be everything that they needed, a big packet of information without it being too much so that they could feel that they were well prepared to enter that clinical year. So I would say that it was the desire to teach, feeling fulfilled in teaching that led me to that. And then this um, need to create a very robust and comprehensive without going too far didactic component to the education. Sure. Um, I love how certain professions, I love the model of hands-on experience, working, being an apprentice, mm -hmm. you know, it, you see it, uh, you see it obviously in, in the medical field, but you also see it in things like trades yeah. where you're starting out to be an electrician. You work with a guy who's done it for 10 years and you really pick up a lot. Um, and, and in a field that's so important and so ever changing like medicine, uh, I can see I bet that there is an immense benefit from having somebody next to you in a real setting, in a real clinical setting, uh, you know, kind of guiding you and, mm -hmm. and showing you, allowing you to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, think that's, that's one of thing. the real benefits of PA education is there's an entire year of that. So after their first year in the classroom, which is that didactic component is complete, that second year is all hands on. Every five weeks, our students are going out and they are working with clinical preceptors on one specific field of medicine. So they could be working in internal medicine for five weeks, then surgery for five weeks. After that, pediatrics and then women's health. And in each of those rotations, they're spending five weeks watching their preceptor, learning from their preceptor, doing procedures. So they could be doing suturing in emergency medicine. They could be, you know, putting in IVs. They could be doing lumbar punctures. And there's someone right there guiding them, showing them. And that is critical to education because reading about it in a textbook is one thing. Seeing it is another thing. And then doing it is very different. And yes. it, and that is um, why I actually very much liked bedside teaching, because I liked seeing that progression from seeing the student hear about it, learn about it, see it, and then watch them do it and watch them become very skilled at doing it. And the way our education is designed is at the end of clinical year, our students have had enough exposures and enough experience where they should be very confident new graduates to work in medicine. Sure. I had a, uh, a little bit of a funny story. Um, one time, uh, I used to take karate when I was a little younger, and um, I got hit kind of on my lip, and I had kind of like a big gash, and um, I needed stitches. Mm -hmm. So I, I went to, you know, the hospital, and 
the whole time, the woman doing the procedure was fine. She was, you know, um, she didn't hint to me at all that she could possibly be new at this. <laughs> and she does, she, she does the, the whole thing fine. And at the end of it, she's like, all right, how do you feel? I'm like, I think I'm good. I feel all right. Thank you. And she's like, you were my first one. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, good choice telling me after it's done. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It was great. Well, I'm glad the experience went well for you. <laughs> yeah. And for her as well. She did a great job. Yeah. Uh, everyone has to learn. So at some point, right. somebody is going to be someone's first stitch that they place. <laughs> right. Um, now, a big reason why I wanted to get you on, kind of an elephant in the room. Uh, you've had a lot of work these past couple, you know, last year, plus, you know, the, the months we're still dealing with, um, the pandemic and the coronavirus and that mm -hmm. type of thing. Um, I first wanted to ask you, how different has this, historically, how different is this pandemic to, to past ones? So it, there are some similarities and some differences. So if you compare to what happened in the past, so think about the uh, Spanish flu, and what happened then, and how we lost a lot of people, and how, um, if you look at any images in medical textbooks, you see these wards full of sick people, and nurses walking around, and physicians walking around treating those patients, and we hear about the mortality rate. So looking at those images, you can see the providers all wearing face masks. If you go back and you look at some photos that were taken at that time, people out in public were wearing face masks. So when we have, when we talk about wearing masks now, and when people get concerned about having to wear a mask, to me, sometimes I think it's a little bit funny because we've done this before. We did this in the past. We did this to protect ourselves and to protect others once before. And there were also times in the past where there were some illnesses that were causing pandemics where kids didn't have to go to school. I know of a few times in the past where that may have happened for a few months to a year. So this isn't new where kids are being told to stay home so that they can protect themselves and stay healthy. What is new is the Zoom education that's being given to the students because that is something that wasn't done before because the technology wasn't there. The other thing too is in terms of healthcare, yes, we had all these people who were very sick in the same room, keeping them in the same area so they weren't affecting other people. We're trying to do that now, but we're better at universal precautions. We are better at trying not to, sp uh, to spread illness. We're more informed now than we were before. And as far as uh, the other aspects of the care that we're delivering, we are very proactive. We know that with COVID, we know what can happen when it gets really bad. We know about the respiratory issues. We know about the need for mechanical ventilation. We know how bad this can get. So we really try to target those patients who are going to need immediate intervention or intervention in the near future and make sure that those are the patients that we're keeping in the hospital and those that don't need to be in the hospital, we're getting home so that they can quarantine at home and potentially not infect others. I don't think that that was something that was done in the past. I mean, I can't say for sure because of course I wasn't there, but I'm not sure if there was this thought of, okay, this person is mildly sick. So let's get them home so that they don't, you know, unintentionally infect another person. Um, so I think that that's something that's different as well. And something different for me personally is the use of tents outside the emergency department. So once COVID hit, um, we were pretty um, strict about who we were letting in the hospital. And we didn't want to let in individuals who were symptomatic or individuals who potentially could have COVID. So we created, not we as in me, but the hospital created these tents to put outside the emergency department so that the providers, um, physician assistants and nurses, could then go out there and see patients without bringing them into the hospital. And so we were going out, we were triaging them, they were getting swabbed for COVID, we were offering some minor interventions. Um, and to me, that was just so, so strange and it just it wasn't normal I'd always worked within the inside of a hospital so to be treating patients in this tent you know whether it's raining or windy or cold or very hot it was just so surreal to be doing that but sadly now this seems to be our normal it seems that so many facilities have these these tents or these mobile units that are outside so you can see these small little trailers that are sometimes parked outside hospitals 
and they're there for that same purpose. So at one of the hospitals that I do work at, we have um, a mobile or a trailer that's outside the hospital, and we're going to be having another large tent outside the hospital. That way we're treating patients out there in addition to in the hospital. So aside from treating patients that we don't want to bring into the hospital because they could be infecting others, the other reason is because of all the overcrowding we're having right now. There's tons of overcrowding in all hospitals, not just here, but in other states and across the country, because when these COVID patients get very sick, they require lots of care. So they require sometimes mechanical ventilation, an ICU bed, prolonged hospital stays. So we need extra space. And we're creating this extra space by essentially expanding emergency departments. Um, and that is something that's, again, very new for me and very different. And, you know, I'm not sure what happened with previous pandemics and how they were able to handle the um, overcrowding situations. But I, I, I would be curious to see what they did do. Um, and now that you bring it up, that's probably something I'm going to look up for my own benefit so I can learn about that. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I think also the fact that there's, I, I alluded to it earlier, there's so many people just on the planet in general. Yeah. You know, a percent of the population now is probably how many people were on the planet during the Spanish flu. Yes. So it, it, that, and that's a big thing in the news. We're running out of beds. We need room. Uh-huh. So I can see how you got to kind of innovate. You got to do something. I mean, people are sick. Yeah. You got to be creative. And, and that's what's going right. on right now. Right. Now, um, do, have you seen in terms of other uh, global health crises, were there any, anything like uh, a, a coronavirus where there's different variants? Because now there's two or three that have branched off of the main one mm-hmm. and they're saying all these different things. Maybe the vaccine doesn't work. Maybe this and that. Um, are there other illnesses that, where this has happened? Oh, absolutely. There definitely are. So I I think the one very obvious one that we all tend to not really think about is the flu. So that happens with the flu, too. And that's why, you know, you hear people say things like, oh, I got the flu shot, but I still got the flu. Well, that's because there's so many different versions of the flu. So that's why that happens. So so that is one. And that's one that we're all very familiar with. Another one um, that I've you know, experienced during my career um, and was one that I was hoping to be able to travel globally for, um, but you know, due to scheduling, wasn't able to do this, was the um, Ebola virus. So in Western Africa, when the Ebola virus was um, really causing a problem out there, there's several different strains of Ebola. And the different strains have different, they each have different mortality rates. And because of how how fast it was spreading, the number of cases, this was another situation where tents were created and tents were created outside of their hospitals. So they were created there because they could not keep infected Ebola patients in the same area as patients who did not have Ebola because of the transmission of that virus. Um, uh, We couldn't, they couldn't do that. So they had to have, um, these different tents. They, this was just, I can't even describe it because this was another thing that was so surreal to me. And my previous supervising physician actually went out and spent about five weeks working in these tents and managing them. So I have all these, you know, stories about, you know, what happened at that time, um, the patients that they lost, how they were able to uh, get people in to care for the sick. And this is just crazy to me. Um, we do have these pandemics. We, we do have illnesses that spread very quickly. And again, the flu being number one that I think people tend to forget about. Um, but the other one that sticks out in my mind is Ebola. Um, and right now we have COVID. And I'm sure in the future we'll have something else that comes up and it's going to be something that's new for us or, you know, potentially even something older that's come back that we have to learn about again and understand more. I'm under the impression um, and this is just something I've heard, and I, I just want to confirm it with you or, or you know, negate it. Um, I, I, to my understanding, it's quote unquote good that more people are getting it and not dying. People that are getting it and not passing away because we're getting closer to herd immunity. Um, now, of course, that doesn't mean we don't need any, you know, vaccines or booster shots or any of that stuff. It's just getting us a little bit closer as, you know, 
humans to, uh, to being able to fight the virus off a little bit better, kind of like the flu, mm-hmm. where some people don't get the flu shot and they're fine, you know, never get, they haven't gotten the flu in years. Um, is, is that an accurate thing to say that it's, it's, I mean, it's hard to say that it's beneficial that a lot of people are getting it. But is it, does it, is it kind of like a silver lining? I would say yes. So in my okay. experience, during the, the beginning of the, the pandemic, so in the very beginning, I was seeing patients that were significantly ill. They were coming in very sick. We're having lots of patients require you know, very intense interventions, and they would have very long hospital stays. In the past month, I would say that I've seen a very large number of COVID patients, but they've all been mildly sick. So not that I want to see patients that are sick, not that I want people to have COVID, but I felt better about seeing them seeing that they were mildly ill and they didn't require hospital admission or they didn't require intubation. So I would say that from anecdotally, from what I've seen, I have seen that because of this uh, herd immunity and because of people getting vaccinated, I'm seeing less severe, less severely sick COVID patients. So yes, they're still there and there still are patients who are getting very sick. Um, but I would say that it's not as often as I was seeing in the beginning of the pandemic. Sure. I think, I think it's a um, great travesty, kind of an unavoidable one, but a great travesty of how politicized a global health crisis mm-hmm. like this can get. Um, and I'm not a politic person. I don't, I don't talk about all that stuff, but it's, it's very evident. You can see how it's been used by whoever in power to impose different kinds of things, which is where I think the animosity for, I think that's where it's coming from for people. It's, it's not so much, Hey, this is a crisis. People are sick. We want to get this under control as quickly as possible. It's more like, Oh, my side doesn't agree with the other side. So I'm going to do this, which may cause things to get worse. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the biggest trap, you know, travesty amongst this whole thing. Yeah, I I would agree with that as well. I I think there, there are people who, because of their political views and following their political party or someone that they, you know, follow closely might say, I either want or don't want the vaccine. There might be people that either believe in COVID or don't believe in COVID. And then there's this group of people who just do not like being told what to do. So because they're simply being told you should get this vaccine, they might not want to get it. And then there are people who have um, reservations about getting the vaccine because they want more data. So we have people that um, may or may not get vaccinated for a variety of different reasons. But I think you did hit on one of those big reasons. So I think one of those reasons is, you know, it definitely is political. Um, I think the way that we can really get more people vaccinated is by informing them about the vaccine, educating them, providing them that information that they need so that they can make the best decision for themselves. I also think that people are kind of weary at the fact that it came out very, very quickly. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, I guess you could say that due to modern medicine, we maybe have the ability to get something out quick like that. That's, I guess, something you could say. So that I, I would say that the one thing I think people are unaware of is even though this is a new vaccine, it's not truly new. So it was this vaccine was created based off of a previous vaccine for another virus that was very similar to COVID. So because of the similarities there, we didn't have to start from scratch. So these pharmaceutical companies already had a a pretty good um, foundation to start with. So they didn't have to go to the drawing board and start, you know, at step one to create this. They had something that they already had in their armament and they just modified it. So this wasn't a vaccine that was 100% new. And I think maybe if people knew about that and, and understood that it wasn't so new and created within you know days, because I think some people think that, um, that they might feel a little bit more secure getting the vaccine. Right. I was one of those people until you just told me, <laughs> um, which is great. I mean, I, I uh, you know, it's a lot of stuff is just hearsay. Yes. Oh, the vaccine's too new and... You know, but until you actually speak to a professional, someone who really, really knows what they're talking about, you don't get these kind of, you know, this kind of insight. Mm -hmm. And, And I think you're right in saying that if we let people know that, hey, this vaccine isn't necessarily an overnight thing. This is something that we already kind of had. It's something that we were able to adapt Mm -hmm. 
um, to the vaccine that we have now, it's, uh, I think that would put people at ease. I agree. I completely agree. And I think that it would be, it, it would benefit us as a healthcare community to really try to put that information out there so that we can at least inform those people who haven't been vaccinated and who haven't been vaccinated because they're concerned about the newness of the vaccine um, to give them that information because that might change their mind. Sure. Now, there's another thing that's kind of been circulating in the news um, regarding treatment to coronavirus. And uh, there's a lot of weird stuff being said about it. And that's ivermectin. Um, Now, from my understanding, I, you know, to me, everybody's saying it's horse medication. And I'm like, well, it can't be solely horse medication because, I mean, people take it. So, you know, and what is, what's the, kind of give me the lowdown on that. So I I would actually be hesitant right now to say that, yes, this is going to be a treatment for COVID because I'd like to see some data on it. I want to see some individuals who have had this treatment and what it did for them. I want to see if it reduced their symptoms, how long it reduced their symptoms for, um, and what other benefits could have been had from having that treatment. Um, I don't want to jump into giving someone a medicine until I know it's beneficial. And that goes down to something called evidence-based medicine. And in healthcare, we make a promise to only do what's best for our patients and to do no harm. And for me, I need to see data that shows that this medication is not going to harm my patient before I prescribe the medicine. So I would say that at this point, I probably don't have a huge stance on ivermectin as a treatment for COVID because I want to see some information first um, because I'd I'd like to make an informed decision. So where where was this used in the past? Um, So ivermectin, uh, let me just double check this so I don't misspeak. (laughs) I don't sure. want to give you the wrong information here now that everything's being recorded right. here. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> so the funny thing is when I hear ivermectin, all I can think of is those mobile units in Belize because we had them on the mobile units. Um, oh, okay. And it's for parasites. So I just want to make sure that my memory serves me right. So this is, it's an anti-parasitic medication. And, and oh, okay. we pretty much use it for things like a uh, roundworm infection. So that's why for me, I... I need to see why this medicine would be beneficial in COVID. How is it going to be beneficial? What is the mechanism of action of this drug? How does it target this virus and what does it do to it? Because right now my brain can't really wrap around that yet. So for my own benefit, I would need to read on this before I can give a good answer and before I can, you know, say, yes, this is something I'm going to give to my patients. Sure. So, Ivermectin historically has been used for parasite-related problems, not yes. something like COVID Correct. or it's a virus. Correct. As far as I know, it's not okay. been used for any viral infection. Sure. Um, another thing, one more thing before we, we're getting close here. We're going to wrap up soon. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about, there's something that hasn't been brought up in the news very much. Um, the idea of promoting overall health, Mm -hmm. um, promoting the idea of supplementing vitamin, you know, different kinds, not just vitamin D, but different vitamins, Mm -hmm. um, you know, just living a healthier lifestyle. Um, do you think that maybe bringing that to the forefront is like, it's going to take too much time to get people involved in that. And we kind of want to put, we want to get the vaccine out first before that stuff kind of, you know, it's it's just weird because to the people who are skeptics about the vaccine, some of those, some of those people will say, Hey, they're not even talking about being healthy or any of this stuff. They just kind of want to push this vaccine on us. Mm -hmm. So I think we should focus first on getting people vaccinated. And then after that, overall health is always important. Overall health is going to reduce a person's, um, reduce the chances of them getting a chronic illness like hypertension or diabetes or hyperlipidemia. So it's always a good thing. So we should always promote health. We should do it, you know, independent of what's going on with COVID. That should be something that we really focus on for everyone, not even just in this country, but globally, if, you know, we're able to do so. 
um, in the program that I teach in, that is actually one of the things we really focus on. We focus on health and wellness. And in fact, the, the Center for PA Studies is housed within the College of Health and Wellness because we, we believe, and I think a lot of healthcare providers believe, that if you can keep your body healthy and you are in a good position health-wise, if you get sick, your body is in optimal functional in, it's, it's functioning optimally so that you can deal with and manage whatever is being thrown at your body. Not to say that you won't get very sick every now and then or, you know, bad things won't happen, but you want to be able to treat your body well and give your body what it needs to combat any infection that it might have and to, you know, prolong your life and reduce the frequency of chronic illness. So I would say, yes, we absolutely have to promote overall health. Right. It's, uh, it's also the idea of how big of a lifestyle change it is for mm-hmm. some people. Um, a, a lot of people have lived without doing that stuff and doing it for a very long time, 40, 50, 60 years. Mm-hmm. You know, some people don't get any type of exercise. Their job is a sit down job and they eat whatever they want, whenever they want. And that's fine. If you're happy doing it, that's cool. Just know that there might be some, you know, if a pandemic comes around, you might be at risk. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is that for these individuals who have gone for you know, a very long time or have lived their lives without really focusing on their health or you know, those who haven't really been into um, you know, much exercise or physical activity, they will have to make changes, but they should do them little at a time. We can't expect patients to make major changes and to do it overnight. We have to understand that you know, this is a stepwise progression. Maybe we'll start first with eating healthy and do that for a little while. Then once that person is eating healthy, then we can talk about incorporating exercise because if we throw everything at people and we say, you need to, you know, exercise every day, you need to eat healthy, you need to have um, some sort of mental health break and you need to do this. People are going to hear all of that and just not do it. But if we give them little bits of information at a time and say, Hey, this is what you need to do healthy. Let's start here. I think that we'll probably have much more success with getting people on the road to healthy lifestyles. Right. Um, Yeah, I mean, I I couldn't agree more. It's, I feel like once people start to get a little bit older and other things start to come into play, jobs and, you know, money and all this stuff, people start to forget. Because as as a child... As a kid, you, nobody has to tell you to go run around. Mm-hmm. Nobody has to tell you <laughs> yeah. to go play, you know, basketball or, you know, anything. You'll go ahead and do it. Um, I think that once people start to get a little bit older, other things start to come into play and they kind of forget about that. The health is like, oh, I'm, I'm healthy enough. You know, I eat vegetables, but mm-hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit more than that. Oh, it absolutely is. And I, and I think you really hit the nail on the head. It's as you're getting older and you have more responsibilities and more things to worry about, you tend to put yourself last. So you might put your job first, your family first, other people that you're taking care of first, and then put yourself at the very bottom of the list. And what I try to tell my patients, and I hope that they listen when I say this, is take a little time for yourself every day. Do something for yourself. If that doing something for yourself is preparing a healthy dinner, great. If that doing something for yourself is going to take a 15-minute walk, that's also great. Just make sure that you don't lose yourself. Make sure that those things that made you happy or those things that made you healthy years ago, that you're still trying to incorporate those now. Um, Because it's so easy to get lost in the everyday um, life tasks and responsibilities and not keep up with you know, what you need to keep your mind and your body healthy. Yes. Yeah, no, that's, that's phenomenal advice. Um, so I think we're going to wrap this up. One more question. Mm-hmm. Do you have anything exciting going on? Anything that you want to tell everyone about? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have a, a new research project. Um, I think we just sure. started talking about that in the very beginning. Um, It's called Stop the Bleed, Train the Trainers course. So this is a research project that I'll be doing with two colleagues, um, Kyle Martin and Chelsea Lacasse. And what we're going to do is we're heading to Rwanda. And in Rwanda, we're we're going to be training um, 
bystanders and people who work in the community, non-healthcare workers though, we're going to train them on stopping hemorrhage. So hemorrhage control. And we're gonna train them, we'll give them a pretest to understand what their knowledge was before we train them, and then a test afterwards to see the knowledge they acquired from our training. We're then gonna have those individuals train others who are likely to be first responders to evident, uh, incidents of mass casualty, incidences of um, you know, uh, landslides, because that's something that happens out there frequently, or um, car accidents, or anything where there can be an individual with significant bleeding so that we're getting as many people trained as possible who know how to stop hemorrhage or who know how to um, control bleeding. And then what we'll do is go back six months later and then test or, or quiz those individuals who we initially trained to see how much information they retained from our initial training session. And our goal is by training these people and then them training others, we're going to get as many people out into the field as possible who have the ability to respond to an incident where somebody is bleeding significantly and stop that bleeding. Therefore, we're reducing morbidity and mortality. So that is my next project, and I will be heading out there in February to do that. Wow. I, I love that idea because it's, it's kind of along the same lines of, you know, teach a man to fish, they'll be able to eat forever. That is exactly guys... it. Yeah. Sorry to cut yes. you off. <laughs> No, no, you're fine. Um, Cause uh, you know, you guys aren't gonna be there forever, but it's, uh, that's such uh, uh, it's really a noble act. And, and you know, I'm sure they're gonna thank you. And uh, you know, we thank you as well, because that's, that's a, like I said, you guys aren't gonna be there. So when a landslide happens or somebody's, you know, busted up, there can be, you know, someone in the village. Hey, I, I, I you know, I learned, I, I can help you know, and multiple people come together and, and that's great. Yeah, that's the, the hope that we have. So I, I'm very, I'm very much looking forward to it. And I'm even more looking forward to when we go back after the project is done to see what sort of, um, you know, knowledge was retained and how these people utilized what we taught them in the field. Yes. Well, all right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. This was a phenomenal conversation. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you very much for the invite. It was great speaking with you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. Talk to you Monday. Peace.